actively consider what are the capabilities of this hybrid world because think about it when the prius first came out we all made fun of it and now now i'm terrified by them because they creep up on me and you can't hear it terrified. exactly but it also it also paved the way for the tesla that's, that's true and so it's like hybrids also they, they they put us through the experimental stage to create to create what we perceive as a thoroughbred and we're not quite there even in the car world but it's coming so i think that's um i have a lot to say about that but i hope that's encouraging it does take but it's still a human process so i think it takes a little bit of vulnerability to say like i'm gonna i'm gonna figure this out and i'm gonna trip through it until we until we get it right because it has opened up incredible opportunities over COVID, I've been able to be in six, like you too, I've been able to be in six cities in two days. And now, if I go to a city, it takes me three days to go to one. Our conversation today is with my good friend, Dr. Rob McKenna. Uh, Rob and I are going to talk about what it means to be a whole leader. So, uh, I know that term may not be common sense to you, and it wasn't to me either, but Rob kind of helps me see what does it mean. And in fact, he's got a TED Talk coming up this Saturday in Colorado on becoming a whole leader in a broken world. So Rob is an amazing guy. I've had him on my show before. He's an IO psychologist. Um, he used to teach at universities. He's the founder of Wild Leaders. Um, he's a TEDx speaker. So uh, he's, he's really just doing amazing work around leadership today. So listen real close. Rob's going to kind of help us kind of set this picture of what it means to be a whole leader. He's going to talk a lot about how we do that and even in the world that we're in today, kind of in that hybrid workplace. And then we're going to even talk about the importance of community because wild leaders not only create that, but if, it's, if you're like me, man, I've been really missing community and needing community. So he's going to even give some pointers around that. So I know you're going to enjoy the conversation. Listen real close. Take lots of notes. I sure did. And at the end, I will hit all my notes and we will talk about where, what we can do with this and how we can become whole leaders ourselves. The Workplace Therapist Show is sponsored by The Leadership Foundry. The Leadership Foundry brings a cutting edge, real world approach to leadership development. The Leadership Foundry partners with each client organization to create a custom tailored experience, virtual or in person, that combines innovative leadership content, world-class facilitators, and one-on-one -on -one coaching to ensure your leaders have everything they need to grow and thrive. To find out more and to design your one-of-a-kind program, visit myleadershipfoundry.com. Bob, it's so good to have you back on the show. I'm really excited about our, our conversation today. I'm excited about kind of really talking about leadership today and your particular perspectives on that because I always admire all the work you do and your perspectives around it. And, you know, and talk about kind of um, how you define whole leader, um, because I think that's going to be really, really important. Uh, but before we do that, for folks that don't remember or, or maybe haven't heard your first show that you were on with me, because that was pre-pandemic, um, share a little bit about, with the audience, share a little bit about who you are, what you're up to today, and kind of what got you there. So I'm a mutt. <laughs> I, say, uh, I knew that was the reason why I like to bring you yeah, on the show. <laughs> someone had a better word. They said that sounds so negative, and I'm like, no, I think it sounds pretty good. Um, but I, you know, I spent 25 years in uh, in a sort of a combined role in higher education, like on a university context and two different universities, but also running a business and and working with all the usual suspect corporations, and but all small, like small to mid cap companies and nonprofits. And, uh, and then I, this organization, Wild Leaders, that um, is the organization I founded, um, and it's all focused, and Wild stands for Whole and Intentional Leader Development, where we provide a, a system for leader development. We always tell people, like, you have a system for everything in your business, you know, you have to have a system for developing leader capacity. And so that's what we do, and, uh, and that started to grow. And so right before COVID, I resigned from my role in academics after 25 years of being in a dual role. And I think you know this, that I, I, I didn't realize how stressful over the years it was having two jobs. And mm -hmm. so um, it's been an amazing journey of knowing of, of my own learning and what it means to be a full-time CEO. Um, and and in, in many ways to feel like all these years of even scientific press preparation, theoretical preparation, while I was doing work with organizations, really kind of, I feel like prepared me for this moment. Um, and so I don't, if that makes sense, it's like, I, people have asked me like, do you wish you would have gone full-time toward wild leaders earlier? Um, I don't know that I was ready, you know? So it's, um, so anyway, it's just, that's what I do. It's all about that all day long. And it's been an amazing season. 
um, for these last couple of years, I'll tell you. So, yeah, and, and a really interesting time too to be studying and watching leadership. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. Sure. Wow. Well, okay. So you've got a TED Talk coming up, and towards the end of this month, and this 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 show will air before your TED Talk, likely. Right. Okay. So, so um, it's going to be your TED Talk. I wrote down "Becoming a Whole Leader in a Broken World." Is that still the title? That's still the title. Okay. So tell me about um, Whole Leader, uh, because I, I got a chance to watch your um, second video, the one that you submitted to the committee. Yeah. I d didn't know that was the process these days for TED Talks. Really interesting. Uh -huh. So, and uh -huh. I love the video, um, but, but, but I, I, maybe that's a good jumping off place for us. What does it mean when you think about Whole Leader? What is your, what is your manifesto around that? What does that, what does that mean to you? Well, there's like, there's two sides of that. I think one side is like from a, from a, let me go scientific for just a second and say that I've, I've always been fascinated by, because I've had a chance to work with, do several longitudinal studies of leaders in different contexts and just had this amazing privilege to sort of be sitting in front of them, but studying their journey and, and looking at all the theory to pull on theory, um, what we know already about how leaders learn and grow. And what's, what's immediately apparent is that most of the research is in, is in silos. And part of that, I'm not blaming scientists for that because it would take multiple lifetimes to actually put together a study that, you know what I mean, that would integrate yeah. it all. But instead of, you know, a leader's journey isn't just about motivation or goals. It's not just about their character. It's not just about their purpose. It's not just about um, their network. It's not just about their experiences. It's all these things. And so I'm an integrator. And so I, and I've had the opportunity to say, like, if you put all that together, what would it look like to leverage decades of research to look at the whole story of a leader? Because the other part of that is I'm wired for is I love data, but I also love narrative. And so a lot of the, the things that we have done have brought some like some measures of progress alongside a leader's narrative, because even though there might be common themes or taxonomies of different things in leaders' lives that they share, that the nuance and difference is always there as well. Um, and then the other the other part of whole, and I'm, I'm trying to, you know, in preparation for the TED Talk, even finish my, the, work, the draft of my next book, and I'm writing like crazy. Imagine trying to write a book, Brandon, about being whole. <laughs> like, it's everything. And so it's, um, and one of the, the fundamental pieces of that is dealing with the, the reality of the paradoxes in a leader's journey, in any human being's story. Mm. Um, that every, everything has a tension with something else. When you really get real about what it is that people are discussing and trying to figure out is, is it about me making progress or is it about me being present in the moment? Is it about me or is it about all of us? You know, is it about self-preservation or is it about sacrifice? And I, I would suggest that it's not about one or the other. In every case, it's like, you know what I mean? Like we're dealing with these. So a lot of my writing has been a, around that tension. But the last thing I'll say is just that what's killing me I have a lot of conviction around like I, I really do. And this is, this may sound pithy or overstated, but I think we're in a leadership crisis. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think the crisis is ours to own because there's a lot of talk about the kinds of leaders we want, but very little talk about what it will mean to sustain the kinds of leaders we want and prepare mm -hmm. them for the job. And I think, to, to develop a leader who really is bringing their whole story and their, the, the real story of what they're dealing with internally. We're talking about a human being, not a machine that we want a leader who shows compassion. Yes. But we also want a leader who brings conviction. You know what I mean? And so anyone that says that that's not a fundamental tension, is like missing the reality of what leaders have told us over the years. So, so I, I even thought about calling the TEDx, you know, a, a whole leader reformation. Cause I, I'm not talking about moving it like a revolution against what's current, but to say, if we took what we already know, and, it's, and that's as simple as just looking at Brandon's story, by the way. You know what I mean? It's like you look at any one of our own stories, and it's complex. Um, if we took what we already know from research and the experience of leaders, we could do a better job of thinking more in a more whole way about what's going on in their world. So that's, that's my conviction about the TEDx. And the last thing I'll say is this, is that if there's anything the last 18 months have given me, the benefit of, of virtual has been incredible. Um, I, uh, people are beating up on it, but I, I got on a stage, Brandon, a few, this was a couple, you know, the first stage I got on. And you, so I was in, you, get, you put 2,000 people in a room, and I had to say this when I got up there. I said, this is different for me because for the last 18 months, 
I've been able to see the faces of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. I can look at their faces on my screen. I'm standing up here. I can't even see you because of the lights. And if there's something I've had a front row seat to, it's the, it truly is the brokenness and the beauty and the redemption inside of every human being who's trying to go first and lead. And so I feel a deep conviction around, let's get real. Let's really prepare these folks to, in a whole kind of way for what's ahead. So I, <laughs> Yeah, a lot. Okay. Go. But that's a good setup. And I've got a follow-up question because I always have follow-up questions. All right. All right, Rob, you ready? I'm going to hand you my magic wand. Okay. And now you've got the magic wand and you can wave it and you can wave it and you can create a whole leader. And there she is, or there he is. Okay. Describe to me what would a whole leader, how, how would we know they're whole? What, 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 what would be kind of behaviors that we'd see from them or or ways they would carry themselves or walk in the world where we would say, that's, that's it. That's the leader that, that, that not only we want, we need right now. That's so good. So one of the things that I, I, I try to avoid talking about is the outcome of whole. Because it's a, I think this side of some other kind of reality, it's an aspiration and not an end state. It's like, um, I always talk about the, one way I talk about this is related to the constitution of the United States or the constitution of India. Is that those are, they're beautifully written aspirational documents. Yeah. They're aspirations. Yeah. We need an aspiration for what wholeness, because they really are. That's why they're so complex. And I, um, but so wonderfully attempted to write, you know? And so it's like, so what I would say is um, that the first part is, is giving people permission to see the difference between their current reality and their aspiration. And now, and, and from a leadership perspective, this is so important because a lot of our client organizations will say, one of our clients said this, and he said, you are all about deep seated leader preparation. And I was like, yeah, and which takes time. And so when you, to get to the nitty gritty of that, this is why some of the conversations that are, that seem kind of mechanical and more and more normal, but when you put them in a whole perspective, what I would want for each of us, for you and for me and for every person in our sphere is that this is a person who is constantly and continually becoming aware of things like, why am I here? What are my specific competencies at this point and how are they changing and how do they relate to the competencies of my team? Who's surrounding me? Do I have, do I have an expanding network of specific names of people who are role models, mentors, people who give me tough feedback, um, this other question I would say is their movement toward wholeness. Am I willing to edit? Like I want a person who's being given permission and invitation into being coming a different person, part of themselves, because most of the time we prescribe change. We don't invite it. I'd want a person who had a, who had an audit of their past experiences and what they're experiencing now and what they're experiencing in the future so that they would understand the context within which their development is happening. By the way, this is what we built tools for, but it's like, I'd want to, whether it's a 20 year old on a university campus or a senior leader who just transitioned from having a 10,000 person organization to four or the other way around, I've seen the power of this deepening conversation that includes narrative and measures of the progress against those things. Um, and so it's like all the normal things, goal setting, competence, experience, purpose, and call, like, um, but to have them with deepening understanding. So the next time they go into that next interview, they're honest and they go like, and then the, the, my dream would be the recruiter says to you, if you went up for an executive role, they'd say, how do you know this about yourself? How do you know what you're, what you need to learn? Why are you asking the question? Like what competencies do I need to develop in this next role? You know, it's just how amazing that is, but it takes time. And, um, and for us, it's like, we're watching people go, you know, organizations go through their third iteration of this conversation. And it's incredible. <laughs> yeah, so it sounds like, if I was to sum it all up, it's like deep, deep, deep self-awareness that is applied every single day. Is that a good way to sum it up? Specific scaffolding on where, what kind of awareness are we talking about? You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. They, they, yeah. they understand their story. They understand their competencies. They understand their purpose and calling. Um, they're aware of their team around them. They're constantly trying to edit or amend to be better in the situation. And they're asking, why am I here on a regular yeah. basis? Yeah. That's good. Really, that's really good stuff. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm all about practical steps. So 
okay, if we say, all right, I love this picture that you just painted, Rob, like I want to be that, that person. You know, I'm going to ask, where do I start? Well, it just feels, it's like, I, I, I came out of COVID, Brandon, I came out of this, and the, the first time I spoke, I, I was like, and you know my colleague, Daniel Halleck, like we came out swinging. And because I saw this, I'm like, I will never deny people the process that I built. And I spent my entire career building an infrastructure because the problem with that whole picture that you and I just tried to describe is that it takes some structure to do that. It takes a system to do that. And I, I've been trying to teach my sons to uh, lift weights. So I, before they went back to college, so both my, I'm about to be an empty nester. So it's amazing. Oh, and I, um, I I'm, a little to, bit, I'm a little bit behind you. I'm catching up. Okay. I'm almost there. Okay. So I, one of my sons is now in Southern California. The other one's going back to college. And I, but one of my goals over summer was to teach him how to use a gym. And what I told him was there are certain muscle groups that it's not rocket science. You know what I mean? Biceps, triceps, shoulders, chest, back, front of your legs, back of your legs. So we know that we know the fundamentals of the body parts of what it means to develop yourself whole physically. Well, what I, what I, what I often say is like, we know the fundamentals of what it means to develop yourself whole as a leader. And so what it takes is a system of machines. So it's like you walk into the gym and like, you don't have to use that bench press to develop your chest muscle. You know what I mean? Like there's a variety of ways to do that, but you have to have a structure and a scaffolding to do that. So the steps we've done is like, we created a system that scales inside organizations to do this, that actually has a person assess, um, not measure, not like test, but personally assess their, 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 their competence in these different spaces systematically to go through that process. And so I don't know if that's what you're asking, but I, I came out when I got on that stage last time, I'm like, I'm done feeling like I'm selling something. I will not deny people the process I spent my lifetime building. <laughs> so, and it's been amazing to watch when people have that specific structure or set of machines in the gym, when they begin to work those muscles, it changes things, um, but it takes time. So, yeah. I, I think that's really good. Why I like that analogy so much is I almost think about those machines in the gym or those exercises as forms of feedback on a particular thing. Feedback on, you know, your, your relationship with other people, feedback on your competencies, feedback on different things. Ultimately, yeah. so you can use those. So if we go to kind of, you know, weightlifting 2.0, it's so you can do compound lifts, right? So, so now we're not just working one thing. We're doing things like deadlifts or back squats or other things that are working multiple muscle parts at the same time. But you've got to you know what's crazy about that that you'll appreciate that you just mentioned is like one of our clients, a CEO said, when I first jumped into your wild process, he said, I felt like you threw me into the deep end. Like you just like Daniel Halleck just pushed him into the deep end. And he said, I'm just I'm not, I'm, I barely stay keep my head above water. But then he said, I realized that you guys were standing there with a life preserver. So you threw me a ring. So now I'm floating. But he, his organization has been through this process of like whole leader development for the third year. And he said, now I'm starting to swim. Because now he's seeing the performance management in an organization, like normal conversations around keeping his organization moving forward are happening. That's where development is occurring in every one of those conversations. So to your point, like it, it, it does change. And what's also awesome is that as people, it, it's crazy, Brandon, how many people have never thought about the possibility that they're a leader who are leading at huge scale? Because they never yeah. thought about that identity switch where, you know what I mean? Like the organization on your desk, like the manager says, okay, I've got a bunch of cups on the desk and my camera's here and I got to I got to organize this stuff. And the leader says, why did that stuff get on the table in the first place? <laughs> you know, it's like that step back is what, what's been amazing to see. So, yeah. so I want to segue a little bit and, and have you comment a little bit on whole leader in a hybrid world. Like what, what is, what are you seeing in terms of, where the world and work and leadership's going when we've got cameras and maybe stuff in person and some mix of that? Yeah, that's interesting. So I don't know if this is going too deep too fast, but I've gotten to this because people have asked this question, you know, and I, I think what's interesting is that this is the use of the word hybrid, first of all, is important. Mm. But it, may, it caused me to look up what a hybrid is. I'm reading, I actually have some notes that I prepared if you were to ask me this. And so I, if I could read like, I, I define it as a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but listen to the, the actual definition of a hybrid. It's the offspring of two plants or animals of different species or varieties, such as a mule 
It's a hybrid of a donkey and a horse um, or a Z donk. <laughs> half donkey, half zebra. Or for those more, more educated among us, the liger, right? Which is from Napoleon Dynamite. The, uh, it's, uh, it's that half lion, half tiger. And what's interesting though, is about, I think the relevance of that to our organizational work is that there's a difference between um, a hybrid and a thoroughbred. And it's interesting because th- all this hybrid, all this difference in the change of like this work context was a change. All it was, was one more fundamental change. And that the, the, the reality is that eventually a hybrid becomes a thoroughbred. So I think we're just, we're still in this, we're trying to figure out what it's going to land like about we're still in this, this hybrid phase. I mean, I grew up in, I went to high school in, in uh, rural Kentucky where, where there's thoroughbreds everywhere. And quite literally thoroughbreds were created. They were originally hybrid horses that were created. And so some of the things are interesting about like that hybrids cause controversy. They always do until we perceive them as a thoroughbred. Because a thoroughbred horse is not a, is not actually a thoroughbred. It's just we start to call it that. So I think what's interesting about it is that when I when I encourage leaders, and it's it's I, I don't feel like this should be rocket science, but I would tell you is to pay attention to, and I think this is also customized to different leaders. Because some leaders I know in my sphere are like I just I need people. And I'll tell you that the introverted part of me does not need people that way. Like in some ways, this has created an awesome way for me to connect better. Mm-hmm. So I think what's going to happen is that eventually what's, what we don't know is where is virtual going to land within the sphere of, of face-to-face. Yeah. But the unfortunate thing is how poorly many people have done at, at leveraging all the possibilities with virtual. Um, and so even restructuring. So like for every virtual conversation we create, we have a producer who runs the zoom we have an MC and then we have a content person. I know not everybody can do that, but you can do pieces of that. Yeah. Um, but it does take a little bit of vulnerability and a willingness to say, like, I'm figuring this out. That managers were never good at in the first place, right? So it's something we all got to work on. Um, and I just, and there was, there were, I, yeah, I, I made a lot of notes about this, but I think what is fascinating, if I were to encourage people, is just to, to really actively consider what are the capabilities of this hybrid world? Because think about it. When the Prius first came out, we all made fun of it. And now, now I'm terrified by them because they creep up on me and you can't hear it. Terrified. Exactly. But it also, it also paved the way for the Tesla. That's, that's true. And so it's like hybrids also, they, they, they put us through the experimental stage to create, to create what we perceive as a thoroughbred. And we're not quite there even in the car world, but it's coming. So I think that's, um, I have a lot to say about that, but I hope that's encouraging. It does take, but it's still a human process. So I think it takes a little bit of vulnerability to say like, I'm going to, I'm going to figure this out and I'm going to trip through it until we, until we get it right. Because it has opened up incredible opportunities over COVID. I've been able to be in six, like you too, I've been able to be in six cities in two days. And now if I go to a city, it takes me three days to go to one. So yeah, Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Okay. So I want to, um, Take, take us down another path. So at, at the moment we're recording this, next week, you're going to be talking about community. And, and, yes. I, and I want to have a little bit of discussion about this. I know it's early on. You still probably, you're still getting your thoughts together around this. But, but Rob, this is so important because all the clients I'm talking to, it's, it's funny. That it's like we're all going through the same waves together, but we're all doing them isolated in an isolated way. So we think it's just us and our journey, but everyone's experiencing the same thing. And they're all at a point where they're feeling like they're lacking community. They've lost community because community before might've been their workplace or where they went to, you know, where their, their place of faith or where they worked out or where, what, and they're not, they're not with those people anymore. So I had one client tell me, she said, you know, my identity was so tied up in my, in, with my, in my, in my work and my colleagues at work. And I thought about that all the time. And now work has just kind of become work. And my identity has been much more tied up with my family. She's got two young yeah. kids and a husband. Yeah. She said, that's great, but it's just now just the four of us. It's just the four of us. And we don't really have any community and we're really hungry for it. So I, I would be really curious too, as you think about whole leader, you think about hybrid going to thoroughbred. And now we have this big gap of community or need for community. What, what is it when you think of community, what does it mean to you? And, and how, how might we be able to scratch that itch a little bit better? Well, thanks for priming my thinking for next week. So, 
I would first to get some of the, the science behind this out of the way is that social support is one of the most powerful organizational bar- variables ever studied. So if you had studied anything organizationally in the 90s, like when I was going through my own PhD program, it was being studied quite often. Um, it's not studied much anymore, but if you plug social support, whether or not a person had it into any study, it would soak up all the variance and all the positive outcomes. You know what I'm saying? So it was like, if someone had it, it was amazing. If they didn't, it was not so amazing. And so what ended up happening is that uh, people stopped studying it, as far as I can tell. And it got more specific into, so what kind of social support do people need? So people started studying mentoring or role models or, you know what I mean? Like feedback networks or different things. And so I I have a lot of conviction about this because we created a tool that actually helps a person build a strategic network because most people don't know how to do that. So it's not just about getting surrounded, but I think for leaders is getting strategically surrounded is, in, is really, really important. That's kind of the, I would say that is, that's the business case because every leader in yours, in my sphere of influence needs a documented list of names of people who occupy certain categories of their life. And so that's what I just, I started, I used to do a thing about this where I'd go around and, and I, people were like, Bill, I need a tool for that. How do I do that? So we built a tool for it, but in a, in a more <laughs> part related sense, um, you know, I, uh, that, that, that feeling of, of, of being alone, being, I, I should say it this way, of being the only one is the worst lie we could feel because it's just not true. Every person feels this at different times, but the lie then gets in the way of us actually building community. And I know that like, we created something uh, at the beginning of COVID. We thought, how do we serve people in our sphere of influence when a lot of businesses were sort of, were resource tight. So we thought, let's start a conversation on Fridays. We call it the wild conversation. And let's, I thought no one's going to come. I literally thought that Brandon, I'm like, no one's going to come. And the first, the first Friday, like 30, 40 people showed up. And for, and we, we've continued to do that for this and all this time. It's one hour on Fridays and every week, 50 to 80 people come. And it's what, what it's, what it's been incredible is when you, when you just look for, and just do a little bit of work on architecting safe community together, because that's the way we structure is like get people into initial conversation that's safe and get them a little deeper. It is crazy how fast people will go from feeling isolated to not. And so if anything, what I would, um, first of all, I would invite anyone to that conversation who's like, I need that. I need, it's just a profound group of leaders. But the other thing I would say is I think there's an opportunity to, if we got out of our feelings of isolation and said like, and started to intentionally look for, or be the one who says, Hey, could we talk? Mm-hmm. Like it, the community is people are, are needing it so bad. I just took my son to San Diego for college. You know what my wife, my greatest concern was, you know what any of ours would be, is he going to develop community fast enough for him to avoid the depression or the homesickness? You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. yeah. And so the level of intentionality on the campus he went to, we drove up to the dorm and this, this took work. I know this. We drove up to the tournament. There were 100 students cheering for our car. Wow. I almost drove off the cliff because I started to cry. I was like, I can't even believe this is happening. We park. They took our bags. We didn't even take any bags into the dorm. Wow. And so, but I, what I immediately thought, because I'm a leadership guy, is I thought oh, somebody worked really hard at this. You know what I'm saying? Like, that didn't have my accident. And now my son's, as far as we can tell, he's a weekend and he seems to be thriving, you know, but it's like, so I just would say like, it's the communities are there. The, the being the only one is a lie. And man, any leaders in significant roles or just starting roles is start to think about what it means to be intentionally surrounded. And I got resources for that if anybody wanted, but it's just, I just, I want to give permission to that because it's, it is so critical. So. Yeah, and I think I think it almost sounds like you, you didn't explicitly say it this way, but if I go tie back into the whole leader. That whole leader that, that's standing over here in the corner that you made with that magic wand, she or he will will intentionally try and create those communities for yeah. the people that are within their organization and, and within their their tribe, right? They're, they're, they're going to try and create that and foster that. They're going to organize 100 people clapping. They're going to take your bags for you because they want you to feel that way. And it's risky. Like, you know, that we just covered this topic of sacrifice. I told you, and it's like, it's risky to provide your people with encouragement and resources that help them build networks. Because most of our focus is on retention. 
Do you know what I'm saying? So yeah, this, yeah. All, that's just one of the little risks. Like people we've told like leaders in our, like people who use our system will be leaders will be like, wait a minute. You're asking my people to reflect on who they call tomorrow if they want a job. And they're like, I don't know that I want them thinking about that. I get it. I get, I want my people to leave. But at the same time, I thought, don't you want the right people to stay for the right reasons anyway? You know, it's like, so building that community is also, it's, it's, it's perceived as also a risk. It's like all kinds of risk, uh, putting myself out there of someone rejecting me of you know, finding out that the lie is true. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's exactly right. That's right. <laughs> Yeah. Our, that's, I think that'd be our worst fear, right? What if that, you know, what if, you know, the worst fear is that it's, that I, I really am the only one, but you're, as you're saying, it's not, it's not true. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. Okay. Well, this has been really good. So, um, Rob, I ask all my guests this question. It, it's a, a question. I, I'm a slight spin on the question that uh, I asked you last time. What is one life hack you have for us that can help us either have better conversations or have healthier relationships either at work or at home? Oh man, Brandon. Um, okay. Here's my life hack for today. If you give me just, uh, I got to get it here. Hold on. Okay. I think this is probably the best question I've asked. I asked it earlier on that, on that topic of sacrifice. Um, so here it is. And I wrote this, I know this is a hard question because I like questions instead of like, tell them what to do. So this is my question. Uh, but the answer could be powerful. What personal sacrifice, if you were willing to make it, could restore a relationship with someone else in your life? What personal sacrifice, if you were willing to make it, could restore a relationship with someone else in your life? Yeah. So my hack is a question. <laughs> yeah. Very fitting for you, Rob. Very fitting for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great yeah i had to write it so fast i got chicken scratching but that's i got it fantastic man okay so if people want to learn more about you and follow you join those conversations once a week um, sign up for newsletters get your tools whatever it happens to be um where, yeah. where can they go if they go to wildleaders.org um everything is there um, all kinds of just you'll be resourced up to your ear balls ear balls <laughs> my wife will laugh at that hey that's a hybrid just, hey rob that's yeah. a hybrid yeah and if you go over to resources and their wild conversation would love to see people come on a friday if they're looking for that and they're just like i'm in a space to edit and to learn um it'd be great to have them there but wildleaders.org most on most channels i'm dr rob mckenna um look for me on linkedin it'd be great to to be connected so um that wildleaders.org you'll find it all there one other thing brandon that we started is uh we launched the wild foundation so at the wildfoundation.org because we run into so many people who need world-class leader preparation, that deep-seated thing I was describing, but they can't afford it. And so it's been a way for us to raise funds. So if people are looking for funding and they don't have it, or they want to give to that, it'd be incredible. So the, the wildfoundation.org is the other place to find it. That's great. Well, thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks for all your insights, your wisdom, the gift of you. Really, really, really appreciate it. Uh, keep up the great work. Uh, and I look forward to the next time I could have you on the show. Okay, so I think that was just kind of mind-blowing for me on kind of what it means to be a whole leader. And I, I really like the way Rob kind of outlined that. He talked about, first of all, he talked about what makes leadership so challenging, particularly being a whole leader, is everything is constantly in a state of paradox. So is it about me? Is it about you? Like, what, 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 what's, the, what's the focus here? And even when you think about things like, he said, we want leaders to have compassion, but we also want leaders to have conviction. So everything is about that. And, and one way I, we can think about whole leadership is it's about striking that balance, being in balance versus being too far one way or the other. It's too much about me or it's too much about you or it's too much compassion or too much conviction. He talked about whole leaders kind of understand their story. So they know their story. They know what those drivers are and they know kind of uh, where that comes from. We all have those. Um, they're constantly asking the question, why am I here? Kind of what's, what am I supposed to be doing? What, what's the value I can bring? What are my competencies? Which of these competencies do I need to continue to develop to be successful in this role? Particularly as the world around me changes. Maybe it's because of the pandemic or because I just got promoted or, or I'm in a new company or whatever happens to be. Uh, who's surrounding me? Making sure I'm aware of the people surrounding me and supporting me. 
ties into community in a minute. Um, am I willing to edit? What am I willing to edit? You know, what, what am I willing to change, uh, amend, so I can get better? Um, and then, of course, being really clear on our purpose and call. He says a whole leader has kind of all those traits, which I think is a darn good list of traits. I, I'm working on a lot of those myself right now. Um, and then he talked about kind of the hybrid going to thoroughbred, which is a nice conversation that moves into our last points, which was around community. And he defined that as social support. We talked about all the research around why social support is so important. And we need to be able to kind of not only think about the list of names of people in our, of the, in our life that are around us, but um, also make sure that we are not telling ourselves the biggest lie that we are the only one. He says, that's a lie. There are a lot of other people out there, people who want to be part of our network, part of our community, and frankly, a lot of communities out there that we can plug into. So we need to be intentional to do that and reach out. And we land in the plane by saying whole leaders create those kinds of communities. They create those environments where we feel connected. So I thought that was fantastic. Uh, and just for, for uh, sake of making sure I don't miss it, his life hack was a real big challenge for all of us. He said, what personal sacrifice, if you are willing to make it, could restore maybe a broken relationship or a relationship in your life? What personal sacrifice, if you're willing to make it, could restore that relationship? Wow, that's tough. That's quite a challenge. So really big, big show today. He, he gave us a lot of um, thought starters and challenging points. I'm going to take some of these to heart and see how I can work on it. So not only I can be a better whole leader, but a better whole person. I hope you do too.